uh, thank you to everybody for coming tonight. Um, before we get into the presentation, uh, let's get some announcements out of the way. Uh, announcement the first, uh, we've put a lot of effort this last month into our kidscodecamp.org website. Um, we, because we couldn't really have a Kids Code Camp this year, we, we tried to record all, all of our presentations and, and post them up there. The idea is that it's a forum that allows uh, kids to go and they can watch YouTube videos of the lessons we have. And then um, if they have problems or questions, hopefully they can post on the forum and we'll try and get to those questions and help them the best we can. Uh, we're trying to get the word spread. Not all the content is there. The content was supposed to be there, but it's not still not all quite there, but there's quite a lot there. So uh, if you know anyone who has kids and they want something funner to do this summer than just kind of veg, then this is a great opportunity. Uh, I, I know that, especially for the younger kids doing like scratch, they have, they have a lot of fun doing these uh, presentations. And if, they're get, if they get a little more older and they're a little more serious about it, We've got some great presentations for them as well, uh, including Python and uh, Unity and other things. So uh, def definitely encourage you guys to check out that site, share it with others, post it on social media. I'd love to blow up that site. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, <clears throat> as usual, Mindfire is sponsoring this meeting. Uh, they pay for the equipment, the Zoom, the food if we have it, that kind of thing. So. Uh, Appreciate that. Uh, always looking to hire good talent. So um, check out our website. Uh, let's see, Phil, am I missing anything? No, I don't think so. OK, so uh, let's see. I assume you can see my screen. Is that accurate? That's affirmative. OK, let's do this then. All right, so I'm very excited and privileged to get to talk about .NET 5 and C Sharp 9. Uh, I've been looking forward to this presentation for a long time, ever since .NET 5 was announced. Some of the goals that were announced with it were uh, very ambitious, but exciting. And uh, I think there's, there's a reason that .NET continues to be a very popular uh, platform 20 years after its inception, which is about now. .NET now is about 20 years old. so. Keep that in mind. <laughs> um, so let's get started. Let's see. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, one second. That's not doing my notes. Oh, all right. I guess that's as good as I'm going to get right now. Uh, who am I? OK, well, I'm, I'm Nate. Uh, I am the COO and CIO of Mindfire Technology. We are a company that does uh, code. So uh, unlike some others, we're, we're more of a technology company than an HR company. Uh, we love doing projects. We, we're pretty good at it. Uh, we like to make sure we have good, clean, solid code. So uh, the quality of the code uh, matters very much to us. Um, in addition to that, I'm also uh, co-president of the Northern Utah.net user group, which is this group here, NUNUG. Uh, I'm also a founding board member of Utah Geek Events uh, with the charter to bring uh, technology learning to everybody and do it in a social way. So uh, I feel like I, I, I'm accomplishing a lot of those objectives uh, tonight. Um, I, I love to teach people about new things and I love the new code and I, I knew I wanted to be a programmer since I was five. So <laughs> uh, this stuff is always going to excite me. So that's, that's about me. Okay, so a real quick overview of what we're going to cover. We're going to talk a bit about .NET 5. I am unfortunately not going to show any demos. Uh, I was planning to, but uh, you know, when you work with something that's not yet released, it's it's really risky. And I, I'd rather have a better presentation and just use slides and a less good presentation that doesn't go so well because I tried to do live demo too early on preview stuff. So uh, unfortunately, yeah, I, I'm only going to be talking about this, the code and not showing much of it happening, but I do have code samples. Uh, we'll also be talking about C-sharp 9 uh, and some of the 
we'll spend some more time on the two of the bigger features, uh, records and generators, but there's quite a lot in C Sharp 9 that's kind of cool as well. Um, so, what is .NET 5? So .NET 5 is a bringing together of the frameworks. So with .NET Core, kind of the .NET Core experiment, uh, plus Microsoft buying Mono, plus uh, Unity using their own kind of thing and others, there was kind of a lot of different of these, what they call base class libraries about. And the idea between .NET 5 is to bring all these base class, class libraries back together. The, the traditional .NET framework, the core framework, all the frameworks uh, into, into one. Um, and the idea behind that is there's some kind of pain in the way we're developing right now. And I'll talk about more in a minute, but having to publish just kind of one set, one assembly in a NuGet package, for example, and know that it'll work on the desktop, the web, the cloud, the mobile, the gaming, the IoT, the AI, the everything. That's really cool. And that's a, a place we haven't been in a very long time. But not only does it work on all these platforms, it works on all these different operating systems and, and different places. More, it'll run in more places now than ever before. Um, so a unified platform, that is the, the main takeaway of .NET 5. Okay, so there's a lot of things that are promised in the original announcement. We are now on preview six of .NET 5, and we haven't made good on all of these things yet, um, but it looks like they're making enough progress that they'll probably get all this in here and, and not have to cut, them up, cut a lot of it. So what did they promise? They promised the unified platform that, that we talked about just a second ago. Uh, I've been doing .NET since its beta. And I can tell you one of the biggest pain points uh, we've had recently is um, the fragmentation of the platforms because the first attempt to solve this was something called uh, PCLs or portable class libraries. And let me tell you how much of a pain that was. I remember spending a whole bunch of time trying to do uh, cross-platform code, uh, either whether it's on a, a phone or something else. And I would target my library at, you know, profile 38. And then uh, I would try later to do, add another thing, like I would add a, a dependency and that doesn't support profile 38. But I could go to profile 209 and maybe I can get everything to work in 209. Oh, okay, good. I got all in 209. Oh, I have another dependency. I'm just sunk because that uses profile one something. I, I don't remember all the profiles. I remember profile 38, but anyway, uh, it was just unimaginably painful. Later, they came out with .NET Standard, which helped quite a lot with some of the pain, but it wasn't a complete uh, solve of the pain. It was more of, yeah, these kind of frameworks can kind of work together and these frameworks can kind of work together. You still have to cross compile them. It's still kind of a pain. Um, so yeah, unified platform is really big for me. Um, another big focus they put here is compiler improvements. So uh, they've spent a lot of time trying to make uh, .NET run fast and run fast everywhere. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about these, but faster JIT, uh, faster startup, lower memory footprint, container optimization, AOT support, AOT being very important for Blazor. Um, some other things, um, language improvements, which we get in C Sharp 9, better interoperability. A lot of people overlook one of the operability uh, things that they wanted to solve was Java um, because, well, Java is the language of Android. And uh, until recently, we haven't had a great way to actually interop with Java. Um, they also want better interoperability with Objective-C and Swift and better native exports. Uh, again, more on that in a minute. And then Blazor and WebAssembly was also promised as part of this package. So we've, we've already got Blazor and WebAssembly delivered already. Uh, C Sharp 9 is uh, part of .NET 5 and it's in beta. And the uh, improvements have uh, been made, a lot of them. So we're pretty well close to what they've originally promised in the announcement. Okay. So uh, this is the timeline for general availability. So this is why this slide is this, this slide matters. So .NET will be five will be uh, shipped in November. 
.NET 6 will be shipped in November 21, and that, excuse me, 2021, and that will be the long-term supported edition. .NET 7 will be in 2022, .NET 8, 2023, all November. So the idea is that are going to have a predictable shipping schedule um, and that every even numbered release is going to be the long-term support. So we see .NET 6 gets LTS, .NET 8 gets LTS, .NET 10 later on down the road will be an LTS. Uh, and that's not to say that they're not there isn't going to be a 5.1, 5.2. In fact, uh, as needed, they are going to do that. And in fact, I my prediction now, someone can tell me if I'm right or not a year or so from now, but I bet we get .NET 5.2 before we get .NET 6. Um, that's just kind of how the core has been going and, and .NET 5 really is the next evolution of .NET Core, so uh, makes sense. <clears throat> So let's see, uh, any questions on that? Excellent. Okay, so some of the big imp performance improvements that they've already delivered on are uh, these. So let's just talk about each one a little bit. Uh, spans and ref structs. So uh, <clears throat> ref struct uh, is a new concept in .NET. And what that is, is it guarantees that the struct stays on the stack. These ref structs cannot be put on the heap ever. So one of the things that we're probably mistold uh, <clears throat> often by job interviews and stuff is, you know, what's the difference between a stack, a struct and a, an object or a class in C sharp? And we say, oh yeah, well the well the structs lives on the on the stack and the and the uh, classes live on the heap. That's not always true. Uh, a struct is often heap allocated. A good example of this is what happens if we have a class. So it's gonna be bound for the heap. What happens if we have this class that is, uh, has as one of its members a struct? Does it make sense to allocate part of that class onto the heap and the other part of the class onto the stack? Of course not, that would be silly and, and no language works that way. Uh, and it wouldn't even, couldn't even work that way. However, ref structs are different. Uh, if you opt to create a ref struct, you're opting in to an immense number of limitations on what you can do with that object in exchange for the guarantee that its life cycle will be practically free. So creating ref structs and deleting ref structs are extremely inexpensive. Um, they consist essentially of increasing a pointer on the stack and then decreasing that pointer on the stack or having it kind of just wrap up once, once the uh, call is complete. So yeah, the, these, these uh, ref structs are extremely fast. They actually built these spans and ref structs to make Kestrel a very uh, performant uh, system on, uh, they were trying to make Kestrel much, much faster. Uh, when, when .NET Core first came out, uh, Kestrel was kind of a very slow and uh, awkward kind of uh, server. Uh, but now Kestrel beats IIS pretty regularly in throughput. Um, anyway, so let's see, uh, spans. Spans are uh, just in a sentence, they're a way of taking a block of memory and getting a view or a window into that memory. So imagine you have a a byte array, uh, you can take a span that says, I want to index start at index five of the byte array, and I want to go for length of 15, and you make that a span, and you can pass that into a function, and it can use that span as though it was working with the byte array. Uh, these spans are extremely easy. It's kind of an extension of the flyaway des uh, design pattern. Um, anyway, those are great things we've added. Uh, they're actually available to us now not necessarily in .NET 5. Uh, regex and string functions though, those uh, optimizations are reserved for .NET 5. Uh, the reg regex, excuse me, regex performance has been vastly increased. So um, same with string functions, simple functions like uh, character at or uh, contains and things like that are all vastly improved. Uh, okay, so next thing, uh, Kestrel improvements. 
So uh, like I mentioned before, Kestrel has been uh, performance tuned very well now. They actually have, uh, let's see, what is it called? Is that in the next slide? Pardon? Yeah, I guess so, or I guess not. Um, so there's these competitions that they enter into, which I thought I put in my notes, but I'm not seeing it. Um, but these competitions are the, the fastest web servers available. And there's, they have different kinds of workloads that they benchmark on. And I can tell you that Kestrel uh, is either the top of some of these or uh, represents an impressive showing across all of them. So yeah, it's really become quite a performant web server recently. Um, let's see, uh, in, pin to object heap. Okay, so there's quite a lot of things that have been in, uh, done to the garbage collector to increase performance for it. One of the big things that was helpful is pin creating this new heap. So we know about the three generation heap, right? And then you know about the large object heap. They've created another heap type called the pinned object heap. It turns out that pinned objects were a significant uh, hurdle for the garbage collector in terms of performance. So by creating a specific place where those pinned objects live, uh, the garbage collector can sweep much, much quicker than before. So there's a lot less exceptions that happen that it has to do special cases for, and it can go a lot faster. Uh, another thing that they were able to do is garbage collection performance on server loads where there's a lot of cores, it used to have to pause all the threads on all the cores in order to complete a garbage collection. They've now decoupled most of that. So the threads can garbage collect a little bit more independently of each other. And the amount of pause time for each of them is very minimal. They've also been able to increase the throughput for that and decrease the time it takes for it all across the board. So another huge leap in garbage collector performance. They did this uh, in .NET Core and they did this again in .NET 4, 2 and above. So we've, we have a lot of generations of, of garbage collector uh, improvement, performance improvements. And these days it's extremely fast. The uh, overhead of garbage collector is very minimal. Um, okay, so tiered compi compilation performance. So, uh, if you're familiar with too much of how Java works, they call this hotspot optimization, but in, in .NET, we call it tiered compilation performance. And what that means is uh, if the, the CLR is noticing that this particular function is being called a lot, then it will take a little bit more time JIT compiling it a little bit more uh, for the native platform it's on. So the, a JIT compiler has to make this balance between uh, getting the code emitted really quickly for startup and getting it really well optimized for the platform. And typically you kind of have to just kind of make trade-offs. Well, this allows us to make a trade-off initially, but later if, if we can make a better copy of the code, we, we do that and then we can, you know, uh, it's called, let's see. So we can on stack replace O OSR, we can on stack replace the old method with the new one. Um, and we can get kind of some performance increase for those methods. So that's kind of a neat thing. Uh, if you read the, on the next thing, that's the uh, arm, uh, excuse me, let's see, I want, I want to give my little laser pointer. I like that. Okay. Uh, there has been vast effort in ARM64 performance. If you've been looking at the release notes for the uh, previews for .NET 5, you will notice about half of the performance that they cite is on ARM. They've gone to a lot of effort to try and make .NET very performant on ARM. Uh, ARM's kind of the, the cool kid today. Uh, Amazon has released a bunch of their stuff on ARM for their server work workloads. They claim they get more efficiency that way. Um, Mac is moving to ARM. Uh, Windows has ARM support and they're looking more seriously about releasing some hardware via ARM. So ARM is really kind of a, a popular topic these days. So they've done a lot of effort of trying to get ARM performance on, on .NET 5. 
Uh, next on the list is system.text.json. So the interesting thing about JSON and .NET, <clears throat> .NET has chosen to use wide strings or 16-bit uh, character strings for the base implementation of .NET. The web, on the other hand, decided to choose UTF-8, which is a uh, variable length, but uh, typically for you know typical ASCII, it's eight bits per uh, per character bytes. Well, the uh, it turns out there's a lot of performance uh, penalty in going from the, these kind of narrower strings, these wide strings, and, and back and forth. So uh, system.txt.json uh, is a performance look at how we can do JSON faster. So we're all familiar with Newtonsoft JSON, the number one package download for NuGet. But system.txt.json uh, is the default going forward. And it is very performant because it does not translate these strings into C-sharp strings unless you ask for a, a string back. Uh, it's very lightweight and kind of preserves those strings in, in UTF-8 while it's parsing. So it's very nice, uh, very nice performance uh, packages they've added there. Uh, and again, that's probably to get uh, some of the benchmark scores. <laughs> so Kestrel and, and System of Text JSON, probably more vanity than anything else, but they have got some impressive performance out of them. Uh, and lots, lots, lots others. I, I'm only scratching the tip of the iceberg. These are just the ones that I found interesting, but there has been lots of performance increases. Um, and another notable example not mentioned here is uh, the bit array stuff. Uh, I remember several years ago, Phil and I, we weren't, we we're gonna make a compression library in .NET, but when we started doing some of the bit twiddling, we noticed that uh, there's some optimization problems <laughs> around some bit handling. Uh, and I even brought it up with the, the uh, CLR team at the time. Uh, and since then, they've done a tremendous amount of work getting that. So uh, we could make a, a managed zip live, managed compression library, and uh, it can be very performant. So uh, very awesome. OK, so let's move on. Framework compatibility. Will I be able to use my .NET 4 X assemblies? Uh, so I'm just gonna answer these, each of these questions one at a time. Because .NET 5 is actually .NET Core v.next and not, it doesn't actually relate to the .NET framework at all. The same rules that are in place for uh, the version three also apply for .NET 5. So I can access some assemblies if, so long as the, uh, if there is a parity between what is uh, implemented and uh, it's not using anything that's uh, out of scope. So anything that basically anything that would you could pull in for .NET Core 3, 3 2, whatever, uh, will also work with .NET 5. And maybe a little more because the .NET Core library has now been expanded to include a bunch more things. We now have, you know, for example, WinForms and WPF uh, happening in um, happening in .NET Core. So there's quite a lot more that probably could come across, but um, in general, if it didn't work before, it still won't work now. Um, so next question, we'll be able to use my Core 3.2 assemblies. Yeah, those will just kind of work. Uh, will I be able to use standard 2.0? Yes, those will work. Will a .NET 6 project allow me to use a .NET 5 project when .NET 6 comes out? Yeah, there's going to be full backward compatibility for the .NET versions going forward. So um, if I have something that's a, a .NET 5 NuGet package, for example, is compiled in .NET 5, in .NET 6, we'll be able to use any .NET 5 NuGet packages. Uh, next question, how much effort to migrate from core 3 to 5? Well, as 5 is the kind of the next evolution of core, the effort is minimal. However, there are some breaking changes between core 3x and 5, albeit minimal. Um, so if you're using core 3, for example, as a for a web application, there are probably very, very few uh, changes required to port to .NET 5. OK, take a break. Any questions about any of this stuff I've said so far? 
I don't see any comments on Zoom. Don't see any on YouTube. Of course, I'm not seeing the comments for some reason. No questions. I don't okay. see any questions on YouTube. OK. Uh, well, then let's keep going, yeah? OK, so let's talk a moment about TFM. So over here, I've got a list of popular packages. And a NuGet package, as you may or may not know, is just a zip file. So I could go down the, the .pkg NuGet package file, and I could zip open it, and I could look and see what's inside. And, and if I were to open it for Newtonsoft JSON, I would see all these TFMs, target framework monikers. So net 2.0 means .NET 2.0. Net 3.5 means .NET 3.5. Uh, we've, of course, got the standard. We've got the PCLs. We've got all this other stuff in here from uh, Mono Android, Xamarin, all kinds of things. So uh, we, with the re bringing together the framework, we have an opportunity to simplify this, but only only to a point. So um, the thing with the, the uh, framework is, is thus: um, if I target .NET 5.0 and this would be one of the monikers I could perhaps use, then um, this would apply for anyone that uses the 5.0 framework. So it's kind of the most general case, right? However, if I need to uh, support something that's kind of more of a platform-based uh, package, uh, then they can, they can add to these TFMs and an OS. So for example, here I've got .NET 5-Android. And what that's saying is this targets .NET 5, but also uses Android-specific platform code. Um, this targets .NET 5 and uses iOS-specific platform code. This targets .NET 5 but uses Windows-specific platform code, et cetera. Um, to make things a little bit more complicated than that, uh, we, it's not probably quite enough to say I'm targeting Android, because each API version of Android has its own uh, set of API that's available to it, its own limitations. So what we're packing into here is uh, the framework, the platform or API, and also a version. So if you can see down here, these are version specific ones. So I have iOS 13.0 uh, as an example. And they are necessarily complex. At issue here, we have framework version, target slash minimum OS version, target slash minimum uh, API version, target slash uh, CPU uh, architectures. All these things kind of factor in. So it's it's not an easy thing to just say, well, let's just have one moniker and it's .NET 5.0. So we have all these. Now, they can mix and match. So if I've got a project let's say I'm working on Android, anything that is done at five can be used in the Android project, no problem. Um, however, if I'm doing a .NET 5 only project and I, I need something that's done Android, then I'm sunk, I can't do that. Um, there's also some ways for us to tell it what minimum version. So just because it says I'm iOS 13, I could say, well, but this actually goes down to, uh, to as low as iOS 10, something like that. So we've got these minimum version targets as an optional feature as well. And uh, another thing is it will prefer the more specific over the more general. So if I'm in an iOS project and I pull in like Newtonsoft JSON and they happen to have a net five iOS, I don't know why they would, but let's say they did, <laughs> the iOS version would uh, be added over the just generic .NET 5 version. Um, and I think it's all to say about this. Let's see. Uh, it does add some complexity to how these relationships work. But, um, you know, with so many aspects that we're looking at, it's about as simple as it can be. Another thing to note is for the the purposes of build and the purposes of folder structure and stuff inside a NuGet package, .NET 5.0 actually translates to uh, .NET Core app, just like .NET 3 does. 
and it's the version that's using to separate between the two. So um, you can write it as net five, but just know under the hood, it's just translating it to uh, net core app. So if that throws you off for some reason, uh, just be aware. Um, okay, I think that's all I have to say on this. Uh, it's certainly still a, a, a leap forward between the uh, PCL stuff. This is what I was talking about with uh, this right here is called a profile. Uh, and it includes the different versions of the code that is available. Uh, and then the standard, done standard was meant to replace that, which helps a ton, but is still kind of a problem. Uh, so this next evolution is, is better. So I'm happy for that. All right, any questions on this? Okay. Uh, so let's talk about C-sharp 9. First thing I want to show, talk about is top-level programs. So uh, if you were to write a program in uh, C-sharp 8 or below, this is probably the fewest number of lines you could write, the fewest number of characters even, almost. I mean, we could name this, you know, class P and stuff, but this is... This is, uh, this is almost the fewest number of characters we could possibly create a hello world. It's not bad, but there's some room for improvement. So uh, with top level programs, we can take all of this and simply write this. So here are some of the rules. So if I get my notes here, here we go. Your code has to appear after any using or class or namespace statements. Um, if we want to return a status code, we can. So uh, the next line after this, we can say return zero, return five, return whatever. Um, if we want to use the args, we can. It's a quote unquote magic parameter. So it just is there and for us to use. And under hood, it really is just translating it all back to this, but um, it is kind of meant to be more simplistic to follow, maybe a little more scriptable this way, a little bit more approachable for beginners, um, that kind of thing. Oh, another thing is uh, we can use async and await here, just kind of native. So if this was a, an async call, we could just say await and go. Uh, so these are top level, level programs. Any questions there? That's okay. pretty cool. Yeah, it's a lot less code, I guess. <laughs> in fact, you could do it in one line if you just did system.console.write line, right? Oh, uh, another thing you can have, you can have functions defined below and, and call invoke into them. The limitation there is nowhere else in your code can also call into those. So these functions that you might put down here, <clears throat> they're invisible to everything else can't be used, which is probably a fine, it's probably fine. Okay, next one, and int only properties. Uh, and init only properties are an interesting thing. So take uh, this class we have here, class person. <clears throat> and then when we new up person, we've got these, you know, newfangled <laughs> uh, constructor initializers, not constructor, excuse me, just initializing syntax, right? But under the hood, we all know what happens is this thing is being constructed completely. And then after that, it's calling the property first name, assigning it to Scott. Then after that, it's calling the property setter for last name and setting Hunter. That's all well and good, but the problem with that is uh, immutability. It doesn't allow for these properties to be immutable. Immutable properties, ones that are marked with read only, for example, they have to be set in either the initializer or the constructor. If they're not set in one of those two places, you've lost your opportunity. And so these could never be uh, immutable. Well, immutability is a really important aspect for us. So we want to get around that limitation. So what we have now is added a new keyword for uh, our getters and setters, and it's called an init. An init is a setter that can only happen on 
uh, initialization. So what this will do is now when I run this code, if I had these emitters, is the order of operations actually changes a tad. First, the, uh, well, okay, let me see. I'm, I'm trying, going to try and avoid saying something I don't know is true for sure, but let me tell you how I think it works and how the documentation reads. So how I think it works is uh, it's actually setting these properties as part of the initialization phase and then running the constructor rather than the other way around. Now, it could also be that they're uh, widening the scope of <clears throat> the read only to include the init properties. So it goes initialization, uh, property initialization, constructor, and then initialization. Um, however, uh, what's going on here? One second. I don't know why that popped into a different configuration, but that was weird. Okay, so um, so it's it's one of the two ways. The way the documentation reads is it sounds like that these init's happen in initialization, so before the constructor. Um, however, I'd really love to test that. So one of these days, I'll I'll actually do that. Um, let's see, one second. I'm still kind of. Well, all right, good enough. <laughs> okay, so now we can even do this. So uh, and it, the property, like I said, it's just, just a special kind of setter. And uh, we can do the long syntax too. Notice these are read only. So these are immutable properties or fields, sorry. And uh, we're able to access those fields on, on these knitters. If we were to change this to set, we'd get an error saying you can't can't set like that. So let's see. Any questions about the init only properties? We have a question in chat that's not related. Okay, what's the question? Uh, in, in the uh, top, uh, top level programs, someone asked, what about VB? And so maybe the better question is overall, what about VB? I don't know if we're getting ahead of your presentation here. Uh, no, I did not address VB. Uh, the reason is uh, Microsoft has announced already that they are not adding new features to Visual Basic. Uh, so, as of when was that? I, I read it, but I don't remember what version they said they were going to cut off evolution. Now, the, they're not doing it for five. So Okay. I think that's the answer then. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, if you're using BB currently, I would suggest switching to C Sharp. <laughs> Does anyone disagree with that statement? I have another point of view. I mean, I could be wrong about it, but uh, I don't want to use a language that's no longer being actively developed. So, okay. So let's move on. So this is the init only properties. Records. So I have quite a few slides here on records. Records are really cool. They've actually been in the C Sharp spec, believe it or not, since version seven or so. Um, and they just keep on getting bumped back, bumped back. But uh, we finally have them. They're not quite as they were initially envisioned. So we might've even presented on these before, I'm not sure. But uh, records are really cool. So in records, all the properties are immutable. And uh, we only have properties and constructors. There's no methods in these. They're meant to be just data but uh, the way we can work with them is very efficient and also very easy, a lot easier to work with than uh, full blown classes. So we'll kind of show how that works. Uh, let's get my notes, sorry about this. Okay, so um, here is, oh, you know what? I kind of skipped past that last one too soon because I didn't talk about what makes this a record is this data uh, access or modifier here. This says that this is a record. So it's, it's a class, but it's a special kind of class. If I were to try to add anything other than a, a constructor in here uh, and any other kind of method, it would say, no, sorry, this is a, a record. So 
So back to this. So let's take an example. So this is a record. And you'll notice I am using the init syntax here. And we want to do something with that record. So we say, I want, uh, I guess I'm missing a, a piece here. So let's, let's assume we, we knew up a, <laughs> a copy of person and uh, that's what this is. So uh, for our other person equals person, so let's say we nude it up with, you know, uh, Scott Goo. So with person, sorry, person with, and then we change one aspect about that record. So if the previous, the original person said first name Scott, last name Goo, this person is going to be, this other person is going to have first name Scott, last name Hanselman. We've just changed one property on here. You'll also notice that these are marked as init only properties, but it still allowed me to do this because we're still constructing a new object with this other person. You notice we don't have new new keyword or anything here, but under the hood, we're creating a, we're calling a constructor and uh, we're using this initialization syntax. Um, let's see, where do we go here? Okay, so next thing, um, there is a implicitly generated copy constructor uh, generated for all records. That's how we can get these with statements to work and some other things that we'll talk about. But what it's going to do is going to copy that person except for it's going to use this last name. It's not going to uh, copy, well, I don't know this for sure. I, I read somewhere and it might've changed because it's been a long time ago, but it's not going to uh, make the first name Scott, last name Goo, then come to this and say, oh, nope, the last name is Hanselman. It's a very performant uh, kind of copy. This isn't actually the, the uh, prototype for it, but uh, this, the fields only get set once. One of the uh, reason I, I think that's probably the case is uh, the big thing around uh, these records is that we want them to be extremely fast to deal with data. So we, we want to minimize the amount of copying. Okay. Another thing that they do is they have a value-based equity compare that's also implicitly generated. So if you were to say <clears throat> uh, person reference equals another person, then that would obviously return false. They are definitely different objects. However, if we were just to say uh, person equals other person, then uh, it would be true if, so long as all the fields are the same. So they have these kind of great value-based equity constructors. Okay, so another cool th thing is we can shorthand that syntax. So before our, our class was, you know, public string, first name, get in it, yada, yada. We can make that exact same class in one line with this new syntax. Uh, these are the same kind of properties. They are init only properties uh, and they are um, public. So all that is cut out and we get this in just, just one short uh, terse kind of definition, which is kind of cool. Uh, equals exactly the same thing. You'll notice though that uh, while the default for uh, automatic properties in .NET is setters, the default for records is init's. So, okay, so let's talk about uh, positional construction and deconstruction. We can, if we choose uh, to specify a uh, positional constructor. So we create a, our own constructor. That's what this is here. So any person, First name is first, last name is second. And then what we're doing is we're setting the first name and last name equal to first name and last name. If you're not familiar with this syntax, this is a tuple syntax. So we're saying this first name here is equal to the first name that came in here. And this last name here is equal to that last name there. So we're calling this a positional constructor because later when we knew this up, we're going to just 
pass in data and it's going to know that this first one's the first name it's going to know the second one's the, the last name we can also define our deconstructor so i don't know if you're familiar with deconstructors but uh if you do a lot of javascript you're probably very familiar with destructuring deconstructing is net's concept of that and basically what it does is we can get out these two via position. So this is a positional deconstruction. So the first name and last name uh, are de excuse me, deconstructed from person. So these are something, these, these were uh, concepts that are available now in, in, in C Sharp 8, but in C Sharp 9, uh, the records, they just kind of have them uh, available to us as well. Okay. So next let's, next, let's talk about inheritance. So records can inherit uh, from one another. So here we've got this person class we've been working with. Now we have a student which inherits from person. What we're doing here is we're adding an ID uh, to this inherited person. And it works kind of the way you might expect. So here we are creating a new student, first name, last name, and ID. Um, but we can still uh, work with it as a person or with a, as, as a student. So I'm creating a student, but I'm getting it back as a person. And when I create another person, I'm going to get, you know, just what I expect. Let's see, anything else about that? Okay, no. Okay, actually that's it for records. So before I move on to pattern matching, uh, was there any other, or any questions about that? Did someone actually say switch to Delphi? <laughs> That's funny. F sharp. Yeah, I guess you could go to F sharp. All right. <laughs> so let's move on. Okay, so improved pattern matching. So uh, I'm hope you remember our awesome C Sharp 8 presentation given by Phil, not Phil, Dan. Uh, it wasn't long ago, maybe seven, eight months ago, Dan did a great presentation on C Sharp 8. So C Sharp 8 in, introduced the notion of pattern matching. C Sharp 9 is just expanding that a little bit. So um, for example, uh, we have the is not as a new thing. Before we could say is as a pattern, but now in C sharp nine, we could say is not. And I'm sure this will be blue, <laughs> just like the is, uh, when you know we get full support for it. But uh, basically what this is doing is we're saying, uh, if item is not null, then return. Here we, over here, we can see uh, this is the, the same code, but generated and then decompiled in a, a lower framework version. This is exactly what it returns if item not equal null. So it's just returning that as a Boolean. Okay, down here, we have improved uh, pattern matching for the switch statement. So uh, we can see we've got this kind of life stage enumeration here. And we got this static function to take an age and, and return a life stage. So uh, in the switch statement, we take that age and we say if it's less than zero, then return life stage prenatal. Notice we've got just commas here rather than semicolons and breaks and all that stuff. It makes this a lot smaller and cleaner to read. The switch statement is becoming more and more uh, the cleaner way of doing complex logic, which I think is cool. For less than two, so if we're greater than zero, but less than two, uh, it shows the prenatal. For greater than two, but less than four, then we show infant on and on and on until uh, this late stage adult. Um, this underscore basically means we don't care about the value. And we'll talk about this in a second, but uh, this is a, an improvement on the pattern matching we had before. So what else can we do? Well, we can do quite a lot. So if you'll remember in C Sharp 8, we were able to uh, add these when statements and we're able to do it on is. So when, say, when, just as an example of the eight version, 
uh, when T is, uh, you know, dump truck or that kind of thing. Well, we've expanded that beyond just uh, types to actual logical expressions. So here we have uh, pattern matching. We're going to switch uh, again on this vehicle object. And so what we're doing here is delivery truck T. This is the first pattern match. So what it's saying is if this object that's coming in here, if it's a delivery truck, then we want to continue to match this pattern. We're going to alias it as T so we can work with it later. So when T dot gross weight class greater than 5,000, this is the next part of our uh, logic expression. So if it has a gross weight class greater than 5,000, then we're going to return, you know, some function here. Um, but if it's still the delivery truck and it's less than 3,000, we're going to return something else. And then we have just if it's we just if it's a delivery truck and it's not either of these things, then we're going to return this value. And then lastly, we have the else or uh, default expression that we're just going to throw. Uh, we're just going to throw away that underscore. We're just going to throw a uh, non known vehicle type exception. Okay. So keep that in mind. And now what we can do is we no longer need to put these underscores. They decided the underscore is kind of ugly. And if we're never going to use a variable, we should really actually not have it. So now what we can do is just delivery truck, then it's 10. Get rid of that. We can get rid of that. Um, Additionally, we can even make it a little bit more complex. So let's say we wanted a nested switch expression inside of here. So we can take this expression here and then change it to uh, delivery truck T, one T gross weight class switch. So we have a nested switch statement and then we're able to just kind of, uh, that's what I'm looking for. We're able to combine a lot of these stuff you would have to type out <clears throat> in such a way that it, A, it's more readable and B, it's a lot less effort to, to do this. Okay, next we can even add and statements between these. So we're getting more complex with our logic now. So where before we kind of had one logical expression that was avail uh, available here, now we've got several. So if greater than equal than 3,000 and less than equal 5,000, then show, uh, do 10, uh, yada, yada. So going one more, we can use our null and not null as well. So we can add those to it. And finally, uh, we can use that not null uh, in regular if this statements. So uh, before we'd have to say, Sorry, not is, not null, my bad, not is. So before we'd have to say, you know, not E is customer, right, in an if statement. Now we can simply say E is not customer. So we now have is and is not as first class citizens for all the language everywhere. And I think that's all for that slide. Any questions on any of this pattern matching stuff? You guys are kind of quiet today. It's cool stuff I'm presenting and there's crickets. Maybe you're all awestruck, right? <laughs> the, these pattern matching improvements are just fantastic. The The old pattern matching was the one feature I looked at in C Sharp 8 and thought, this is so ugly and so hard to remember. I'm just not going to use it. The I limited. don't think that there's enough benefit for it, but I think this changes that. It's yeah, much nicer. It's, it's not as limited as it was before. So cool. OK. Um, let's move on. Okay, so target type ex new expressions. So um, we've done for quite some time where we're able to say uh, var p equals new point, right? Three, five. Um, now we're able to actually do the opposite as well. So we can it's type inference, but on the other side, right? So we know we're newing up a point 
object here, but the type is on this side instead of this side. The reason we're doing this is because um, in some cases you get a more readable experience by having the type inference happen on the left-hand side rather than the right-hand side of, a, uh, um, of an expression. So this looks pretty, pretty readable, right? Um, also, for they're recognizing that a lot of us are preferring not to use var for uh, CLR, uh, base CLR types like uh, string and int and things. So it also helps with those kinds of things as well to make our code be just as readable and valuable, but not have redundant types. Um, so here we are, we have a person and we're going to set it to a student or a customer so we can share the base type. Uh, and that still works out. And here we go. We have an int, nullable int result. And we can just say zero or null. We don't have to cast this like we used to have to. So this is also more readable. So that's target type new expressions. Oh, this one I'm so excited about. Um, I, I talk a lot about covariance and contravariance. And uh, quite frankly, contravariance is a part of the .NET framework that has been overlooked. And it's frustrating because uh, the solid principle of Liskov substitution states that basically on the input of, of methods, we want to put the lowest we can down the, uh, let's see. Oh, I have a question. Can you type, just type or instead of I don't know. Let's see. Let's look at that. Um, I'm not sure if you can do or, but that's anyone else want to venture that question? Sorry, I'm trying to be cognizant of the questions. Okay, sorry. So back to my uh, covariant contravariance. So yeah, let's go up substitution says basically, let's say we have a function and we want to do the least polymorphic thing to that function. So the lower down the polymorphic chain you can get it, the better. So instead of passing list of person, for example, uh, if you're only going to enumerate it, then just say I enumerable of person. It will be able to take a list of person that's being passed in, say, oh, it's an enumerable, you know, just go in there. And then more things will be able to use that method because the input is more flexible. Now, of course, if, if you can't just, if you're not doing just enumeration, like you need to add to that collection, then you might need to do like I collection or something like that. But there's generally good, uh, good parameters to put in for uh, covariance in, in types. However, the story for contravariance has never been as good, especially in inheritance so, or, or generics. So in, uh, in this scenario, while we want the most low thing we, we can for the input parameters, we have the exact opposite for output parameters. The reason being is, let's say we have a function that returns a list of items, right? Um, if we return an enumerable of items thinking that we're being helpful because you know uh, we want to be covariant on our contravariant stuff, that's not actually helpful because the very next thing they're likely to do is dot to list and then add to it or something like that. And we want to avoid moving types around. So on the co uh, covariant side of things, we actually want to go as high up the polymorphic chain as we possibly can. So it's more appropriate to turn I list rather than I enumerable in the cases where you're constructing a list or something like that. The problem is in generics and also in um, inheritance, like we have in this example, the problem is we can't, we don't have uh, covariance in uh, the overriding of our methods, nor did we have it in the overriding of our, of our uh, generics, but now we do. So here's an example. We have this abstract class animal and it's got this abstract uh, method called get food and returning this food uh, object. Okay, so now we have a, tar a, a concrete class that's a tiger. A tiger is a type of animal, it's gonna inherit from animal. And as inheriting from animal, we're going to override our get food it's abstract, so we have to override it. So in our get food though, we're returning meat. Meat is a subclass, presumably in this scenario, of food. 
but we're able to override with the meat as a parameter because again, we want our covariant returns the best we can. Um, before we weren't able to do this. If we were tried to return meat instead of food, it would say, oh, this can't override the parameter prototype doesn't match and it wouldn't allow it. Now we can. So we have a substantially better uh, covariant options available to us now. Okay, and I know I went over a lot, that really fast and I knew, know I used a lot of fancy terms. I guarantee someone has questions. So what are the questions here? Let's see, the type inference on the left side being assignment. Okay, I think that's a, an older one. Uh, does anyone have any questions? There's got to be someone have questions on this one. Phil, you look confused. No? Sorry, I was I was participating in the chat and I kind of missed this one and I feel bad because I'm really interested in this. I'm going to review it after the uh, stream. How about I'll repeat it because covariance and contravariance are such complex topics. That might be a good idea and okay. I'd like to hear it. So. Let me just briefly talk on covariance and contravariance in, in and of themselves, and then I'll, I'll talk about the enhancement here. So covariance is the ability for me to have a function that takes a, a baser parameter than mine and pass it in any way. So in this case, let's say we had an eat food method that took a food parameter. So we're adding to this In fact, You know what? Uh, Let's, let's do a little impromptu here. So let's say I've got a public abstract. Oh, that's gonna be really tiny. Let's, let's say make, you have a bigger font. Yeah, let me fix that real quick. Uh, 20, 20 ought to do it. So I have public abstract, uh, way to eat food, and then food, yeah. Okay, if I have an A that is a, a type of animal, our A equals new tiger. Tiger's type of animal. Use some concrete. So if, if I say A dot eat food, and I pass something in here, uh, meat food. Well, because meat food is food, it's a, it's a type of food, uh, then I'm allowed to pass it in and the fact that I'm passing in something that's uh, higher up the polymorphic chain <clears throat> uh, for something that's lower on the polymorphic chain, this concept is called covariance. Covariance is allowing me to pass in a polymorphic substitution, right? Uh, but it's polymorphism in just one direction. It's polymorphism going, you know, down the down to something. So, I, so if I have something higher up. I can substitute for something lower down, right? Okay. However, um, that, so this is covariance. Contravariance is doing the th same kind of thing on the return. So here we have a, uh, a class animal and it's returning a food item, right? In our concrete example, our tiger, it's an animal, so it's an inheriting animal. We're going to implement this get food method. It's not returning food. We're returning a, subs a higher up polymorphic, higher up the polymorphic chain, uh, something called meat. So this meat is going to satisfy <clears throat> the notion of the, this being food. Having something uh, being returned that is polymorphic higher up the chain than uh, what is expected is called contravariance. So that's the new that's the new feature here. Um, if we're trying to do this in C sharp eight or below, we're going to get an, an error, compile error saying this, there's no uh, override substitutable here because none of the get foods that are available are returning food. These, these types, they're cemented. If I, if I really return meat in here, I'd have to cast it later in order to know. And that kind of defeats kind of the point of uh, polymorphism. So uh, this new contravariance uh, addition allows us to return in overridden methods something that's higher up the polymorphic chain like we should. We always should on our inputs go as low down the polymorphic chain as we can and our outputs go up as high as we can in the polymorphic chain. Um, so anyway, 
Yes, very exciting. I've been I've been looking for this feature literally for years and years and years and years, and I'm so darn excited that we have it now. Second favorite feature. First one's yet to come here. Okay, so I've repeated it now twice. Uh, did I lose anyone? Is there any questions about what I did? I understand this. Uh, something so, similar. so I have a question. Just to make sure I got this correct. So yeah. really, the only thing this is saving you is a cast, right? Sorry, one more time. The only one. The only thing this is saving you, though, is a cast at that place where you're using that object. You're just now you don't have to cast that meat from the food object, right? You're right. You're saving you the cast, but uh, what the cast implies is knowledge of implementation. So you're really kind of. Okay. If, you, if you're casting it because you know this is actually returning this, that's a bad idea. You're breaking the law of the meter. You're breaking uh, encapsulation. You're breaking all kinds of, of concepts if you're casting it after that. So, yeah, it's saving you the cast, but more importantly, it's allowing us to keep the integrity of our uh, encapsulation, polymorphism, all that stuff in place. And we don't actually have to incur the cost of the cast anymore either. So, yeah. I imagine sure. too that because you've got better type safety here that you'll have better compiler messages if you do something silly. I won't know till I get my hands on it, but I expect it probably is. Right, it's type safe instead of a cast not being type safe. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, really cool feature. Okay, now my number one cool feature. Um, I'm so excited about this. Um, as someone who, I like to build libraries a lot there's something about solving a problem and solving it really well. And then all the rest of the time I have to, to deal with this problem, I've solved it. <laughs> I love NuGet packages, all right? I love to write new NuGet packages and reuse code between projects and source generators are just the coolest thing. Uh, I'm gonna start kind of at the beginning. Um, this is how, this is accredited to me. This is how I describe to someone who's never heard of source generators, what they are. I say it's code generation meets reflection, meets code weaving. Um, so we've talked about code generation in our meetings before, lots and lots. We've talked about, we all probably all have used reflection. Uh, we've talked about code weaving even uh, relatively recently with uh, post chart. Um, so code source generators are a really neat thing. Uh, again, this is, a, this is a completely novel approach to this problem. So, <clears throat> Uh, let's see if we can kind of get our head around it. So um, it's, as I see it, targeted more towards uh, libraries that normally use reflection or something like uh, post sharp to do, to get their jobs done. Um, it allows code generation to work kind of as though it's already happened, yet it hasn't happened yet. So because we can tell it, we are going to give an invitation to this to the compiler beforehand. The compiler says, fine, I'll expect that it's there. That way we get IntelSense support, full IDE support on there. We get uh, to know about uh, caller targets, et cetera, in design time and runtime. Uh, it's just the super neatest thing ever. Um, but here's some of the, uh, the big, well, actually, let me do this one and then come back to this one. So uh, here's some of the big examples of, of where this would be helpful. So uh, the examples include serializers and deserializers. Serializers and deserializers almost exclusively use reflection. Reflection's pretty fast, but it will never ever be as fast as code that was generated to actually create a serializer for this specific class or code that's actually designed to deserialize for this specific class. So uh, JSON, for example, would work in a completely different way rather than having, hey, I'm going to pass this in and get it back out and it's gonna just match stuff up and go, uh, I get a, a class that's generated. But more than that, I don't know if uh, the JSON is gonna kind of work. A lot of the stuff, I don't know if it's going to work until I actually run it. The advantage here is there's an opportunity for us to know if this is gonna work in IntelliSense time. Uh, so we can know before we run it, whether or not this is actually gonna fly. Um, I notify property changed. I know there's there's a, a different code weavers to add that kind of stuff in. ORM mapping would be another good one because that's code that's generated. 
uh, API calling. So we have an API, we just wanna make a, a nice clean wrapper for it, or we have a platform API or a web API. We can make wrappers for that. Settings access, we've got various settings rather than accessing them by key, we can just access them by name. That their classes can be generated for us. Uh, and lots, lots more examples. So um, it, we just kind of get the best of all the worlds. We get very fast code. We get uh, generated code that uh, is integrated into our IDE. We get um, type, more type safe safety in, in, some, in some of these pieces of code. It's just fantastic. So here's kind of the, the, uh, the life cycle here. So the compiler runs. The very first thing that's going to happen is these source generators uh, get an opportunity to run. Uh, those source generators are going to analyze your source code. How are you using this library? They're going to generate their bit of source code, and it's going to be added to the compilation chain, and then compilation resumes. So it's kind of like we have these placeholders where we say, we're going to compile something here. And then when we do compilation, we're saying, OK, I need to compile, but first, I need to know more about the, what I'm compiling for. Get that information, generate something, spit it out, and we're done. Um, so here's the hello world here. So let's say we have a library that, uh, for some reason, does not say hello. I mean, this is obviously not a, a good practical example, but uh, we always start with hello world. So say this is a library, and, and it's we're calling say hello. Inside that library, we're going to add this generator decorator, and we need to uh, inherit, excuse me, implement this interface. But um, we're going to have two methods that we've got to do. So there's initialization, uh, no initialization required sometimes, but there's initialization and there's execution. So um, inside this execute, we would have bits of statements like this. Uh, you see we have a source generator context here. This gives us information about what is calling. So using the calling contract, we can get all the syntax trees. And in syntax tree, we can say, well, here's the, the file path you're calling me from. And then return that as part of the hello. Oops. Ah, there we go. So I don't have a lot of example for this. I was going to bring up the actual examples from uh, our rosin though. So, okay. So this is the uh, NuGet hub, sorry, not NuGet, the uh, GitHub for uh, the source generators. And let's look at a couple of examples. So um, just look at the generated demo. We'll start kind of here. Um, so here's a, a V model we'd like to, to augment. So we've got these auto notify property uh, things on here. And then here we go. We've got a using generator. So when it runs, it creates a new view model. It uh, writes a text. Property, okay, but that's not the property thing, sorry. Uh, actually, I think I wanted to be in here and here. Okay, yeah, that's what I wanted. Um, so let's see, actually, let's do the hello one first. Okay, so here we go, here's the example we have. Say hello generator, say hello. And that is going to use this generator Hmm. Well, obviously, I am not seeing what I want to see, <laughs> expect to see here. Darn it. Demo. For samples. Hang on one second. Sorry. Okay. Let's look at this one. This is more of what I expected to see. I'm not sure why I'm not seeing what I expect on these others, but um, in the execute, the whole point of the execute is simply to create a hey, stream. Nate? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Wright is asking if he can. you can make it big. 
Oh, sure. Sorry. Thanks. Appreciate it. Better? Yes. Okay. Okay, so this execute method, um, the idea be behind this execute method is that we need to generate a string of C sharp code. And we're going to then take that string of C sharp code and pass it back to the compiler to actually uh, compile. So um, we're grabbing these .xml settings files here. And then for each one, we're going to grab we're going to call this process settings file, which is, is right here. And in this process settings file, we're creating uh, a little bit, we're loading the XML doc and we're creating a little bit of code here. So we're using the string builder to create this class. So we, we create kind of this boilerplate part, first part of the class. In this part of the class, we're appending for each of these properties, uh, we're appending this method here. And then when we're finally, when we're done, we say add source. So this is going to take this uh, string builder we've got and it's going to compile it into this file. And then that's going to become part of the code that's compiled in our tool chain. So just to be clear, we're grabbing stuff, uh, both stuff that, uh, we're grabbing stuff that is not actually probably part of our IDE and we're making that available. And the cool thing is all these properties that we're grabbing in XML here, uh, because the IDE is in on it, uh, we'll be able to use this file as though it's already been generated. So this is, this is like it's already happened, right? So we'll get, uh, we'll get a setting name with the setting type and we'll be able to just use it. We haven't compiled yet, right? But we'll be able to use it still. And the, the reverse is true as well. So uh, this one, it doesn't have any inputs, e.g. we're not reflecting on any of the code, but we can. So let's see if one of these others do. I think this one should. Okay, I don't see what I expect. Uh, here's <clears throat> the first part of a class, we're just kind of saving it as, uh, as this little bit here. Okay, there is an initialize and we're telling it we want to, we want to know when uh, the syntax has changed. And the reason we want to know is we want to be able to update what we're going to be uh, compiling and tell the compiler about it so it can start doing things. So while the previous example, we just kind of outputted something that could be used, used, this one is going to do both. We're going to get some inputs based off of uh, the, the co code that we're looking at, we're targeting, and we're going to get some outputs based off of the code we're emitting. So here we go. Uh, we're adding, I don't know if I property attribute right off the bat. Then uh, we're checking to see if we have a syntax receiver. Uh, if we don't, then we're just leaving. A syntax receiver is, again, this is what we're uh, registering here. This is going to tell us that uh, the syntax has changed on some of the code that affects us. And um, so let's see, where are we? So we're grabbing some C sharp options, we're grabbing a syntax tree. Let's see. We're going to bind an I notify property changed. So we're adding, grabbing this. Little tree. Anyway, it you'll notice this code looks a little bit like re reflection, but it's not reflection. This is actually using Roslyn. We're going through via Roslyn and uh, introspecting these classes. And then uh, again, all we need to do is generate some C-sharp code as a string and pass that back to the compiler and it compiles it and goes. So here we go. This is for each uh, field. We want to process that field. In the process field, we want to add this bit of code here. And we want to name it this bit here. We create a, sub, a string and we give it the value. And here's our syntax receiver. Um, called for every syntax node in the compilation. So if we're looking, if, if we're seeing a field, 
then we care about that. If we're not, we're just going to skip past it. And then we're adding to our candidates the fields that are declared. So this is a, a little bit more complicated example. Uh, I have just kind of yada, yada, yada over a bit of it because I don't quite understand the Rawlsin syntax yet. But uh, the cool thing is that it works a little bit like reflection, but it's happening in compile time. Anyway, uh, questions on this? I would comment that it looks very much like um, uh, there's a there's a .NET language nobody knows about called Prism, and it's Object pa Pascal, which I was forced to use for a few years. And it wasn't the worst language, but it was terrible integration with Visual Studio. And the best feature of it was Cirrus. And Cirrus was code waving, but it was built into their compiler. And so it seemed very much like this. But this has Rosalind, and that makes all the difference. There was no such thing in there. The best you could do was uh, you could query the methods, and then you could get a handle to the before bo uh, body and after body. And it's, if I recall, something like that. And that was about it. You had to do your own parsing, and it was severely limited because of that. But this is a whole lot different in the fact that it gives you the abset, abstract syntax, syntax tree. It sounds like you probably have access to other things on simpler levels if you don't want to, you know, if you want to just put something before the body, I bet there's something in there for that, I don't know. But to have runtime, sorry, uh, design time IntelliSense based on that, I don't even know how they do that. That's magic. That sounds outstanding. It's pretty dang cool. The fact that you can uh, use this thing before it's even, you know, well, it's, of course it's invoked, but, um, use it before we compile. So it's like live, you know, like when the unit tests were, are now live, you have those little dots, continue running those unit tests and the dots turn on and off. It's kind of like, dots. yeah, it's kind of like code generation uh, taking that same level. The code's always going to generate. It's just going to happen in the background. And if there's a problem, they'll tell you. And, uh, but you always know it's just kind of happening live right now. You change a piece of line of code and it's reflected already. So it's kind of like live generation. It's really cool. Um, here's the other half of that hello world. Actually, maybe I can find, well, I don't need to find it, but you remember the, uh, the original sample basically is just calling um, hello world. So namespace hello world generated dot hello world dot say hello. And it was calling that before, well, before it's even generated. I mean. It's calling that like it already exists. And you'd get full IntelliSense. You could say hello world dot and say hello world. And you say dot and you say say hello and you do dot and you just everything would just happen. It's really neat. All right, other questions. Well, uh, I guess that's all. I didn't want to, you know, obviously get everyone too stimulated. <laughs> but yes, yeah, that's all I've got. So uh, we can open up to questions, discussion, or uh, we can go back into the presentation new place, or we can just chat, or we can hang up and call it good. We can also oh, solicit- question, uh, What is Roslyn? Uh, Roslyn is the, uh, the compiler uh, framework that .NET uses. It is a very advanced uh, compiler in that it has a lot of information about uh, the types and uh, things available for anyone who wants it. So uh, it used to be that the compiler that we used for Visual Studio IntelliSense was a completely different compiler from the compiler that actually generated our code. Roslyn was the first compiler that could do both things it's going to compile our code, but it's also going to give you all kinds of information about it. Even if the code that is it's looking at doesn't actually compile yet or at all, it can give you all the information still. So it's a very advanced compiler, probably one of the most advanced around, um, but it's, it's function is very, uh, very good at uh, introspection of classes. Did I, I answer that well, Phil? Yes, um, I would add, I think it was the first compiler as a service that I heard of. Uh, no, they were they were scooped by LLVM. Uh, oh, that's true. Yeah. 
but still cool. Every time I see something that I can't even explain that just blows my mind in .NET, it's because Roslyn was able to make it happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one other thing we could do is we could solicit uh, volunteer speakers or meeting topics. Excellent idea. My first, my first suggestion is that next month we have a moratorium on VB. <laughs> a moratorium isn't like a memorial? Uh, well, a celebration of death, yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, I'll put it on the list, but I don't know how excited I am to do anything VB. I'm joking. <laughs> Other suggestions, more serious ones, perhaps? I would love to see an entire uh, presentation on source generators. Uh, someone should probably do one on, um, oh shoot, what is the new framework they're coming out for Xamarin and stuff that brings it all together, Miami? No. Maui. It might be a little early to look at that, but uh, other UI platforms would be an interesting meeting. I oh, I was right. It is Maui. Okay. Good. All right. How does everybody like the uh, online format? It's a little different than last month where we did just YouTube with the Zoom. I think it's a little more interactive. Is it working out for everybody? Yeah. I like that we can see people. I know we can't actually be together, but the uh, the lack of human contact is dangerously unhealthy in my opinion. So <laughs> the, the more we can make it seem like we're next to each other, the better. That's why I, I kept my camera on. Normally a presentation like this, I was going to put online and I probably wouldn't bother, but uh, I felt it important to add that today. You're a good guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uno is really cool. Frank says Zoom didn't let him in. Shoot. Well, I saw the same thing for a moment, but then it did let me in. I, that was me neglecting my, jo my job. Dang it. Sorry, Frank. We'll uh, learn. Next meeting, I'll promise I will tell it to just auto admit. I don't know. I thought I did that this time. Well, we had good participation. There were, uh, I think there were five or six on Zoom here, and there were, there were about a dozen on YouTube. When I almost suggested when you, I okay well um i think that's all we got then guys i appreciate uh appreciate your time hopefully information is was useful and uh since you're in youtube it would be uh, appreciative if you would subscribe to our yeah subscribe to our channel uh, so when we post our meetings there, you can get that content. We sometimes uh, post other things there as well. Um, if you're not already on our mailing list, uh, go to newnug.org and join. That's where we send primarily our, our uh, the information. So uh, mailing list is kind of a big thing. Uh, we still do meetup, of course, but. And Slack. And Slack. Yep. And Slack. Slack. I think we fixed the issue with running out of invitations. Is that correct, Phil? No, we did. Well, we got a new URL that doesn't have it. Okay. And that URL is on newnug.org on the about page. Very good. Okay. Well, uh, thanks, guys. I appreciate your time. Hope you enjoyed the presentation.